it's a Marmite type building, you either love it or you hate it, and actually the members have really come to love it over the last uh, 18 years since it was built. The original design is really a response to a very unique brief and an extremely unique site. The site is 15 metres off the ground, facing a truly iconic building, which is the Pavilion, Lord's Cricket Ground. The use of the building is very technical, very specific to the needs of the broadcasters at that time. MCC is the largest cricket club, the most active cricket club in the world. It's very important to us, therefore, that the facilities here at Lords are world class and our media centre needed to be refurbished to bring it back up to world leading standards. The media centre was needed back in 1999 because of the growing number of spectators wanting to watch cricket around the world. We have 29,500 capacity here at Lords to watch cricket live, uh, but several millions of people around the world wanting to watch cricket. The original media centre was based in the old Warner stand in three very small rooms and with the World Cup in 1999 coming up, we just had to do something about that and create a new media facility. The original design was by Future Systems, I was part of Future Systems at the time. There was a requirement to reduce the apparent mass of the building and the idea was to produce a smooth curved form which would achieve that. And that was important to maintain the views for the, uh, the members from the pavilion of the trees beyond the building and to effectively shrink wrap the structure around the use within the building. That led us to looking towards boat building technology and the idea of the materials that are used in boat building technology and it led us to aluminium. It's a very strong material, it's a very light material, but it's also very pliable and malleable so we were able to achieve those complex curves. The design was designed between 1995 and 1999. It led the way really for building media centres at that time. But of course now we're 18 years on and the requirements are now to have many more writers, uh, journalists being accommodated in the building uh, and more broadcasting rooms as well. It was very important to us that uh, in our new refurbishment pr plans that we should respect the original design concept of Future Systems. And so because David had been part of the original Future Systems team, we had in David the perfect knowledge to be able to put together the new refurbishment plans. From the in inception of the refit project, we were embarking to increase the performance of the building in every way that we can. That's environmentally uh, and in terms of how it, how it functions technically and as a conference facility, as a broadcast facility. Its primary function as a broadcast facility is fairly limited. It's used uh, at full capacity for maybe 10 days a year and is, there's cricket here for maybe 50 days a, a year. But what's important is for the rest of the time for the building to have a useful function. So it's used for conferences, for meetings, for parties. So what was uh, uh, important for us was to improve the facilities and in, uh, include facilities that allowed that to happen in a very useful uh, way to generate that additional revenue stream for the club. There's the MCC, there's the English Cricket Board, but primarily the people who use it. So you've got the writers and the journalists. You have the broadcasters like Sky and BBC, and then you also have the photographers. The biggest challenge was knowing what the existing building was and how it had been constructed. So whilst it's easy to look into the, the glossy brochure that was produced at the time of the original construction and kind of look at photos and try and take bits out of that, use David's anecdotal evidence to kind of inform our, our knowledge, really pulling together um, almost an as-built of the original building before we could then assess where we could add bits to it, uh, particularly the gantry and the new mezzanine. Those, those things are quite heavy, extra bits of um, structure to the building. An interesting challenge for us at the beginning of the process was really to capture the reality of what, what, what's there. When the building was completed 15 years ago, the, the level of detail that we would have included in O&M manuals was, was much less developed than we would do now. Part of that process uh, was to take the 2D fabrication drawings that we used in the original build, uh, to take that into our, uh, our, our virtual software and build the existing shell as it was designed. 
We did that firstly by looking at the historic 2D uh, DWG um, drawings that were used for the templates um, for cutting the aluminium ribs. We were then able to digitise that in 3D in Revit. We also then built the shell of the building um, using Rhino um, software. We then validated that with laser scanning to see where it might have moved a little bit or moved from the original design because there was a there was a fair amount of craft in the uh, original construction. We then looked at the inside of the building and laser scanned the internal layout. And what we were looking for were voids between the existing structure and the existing interior. We then, uh, using our 3D software, uh, um, coordinated the architecture structure and the M&E to reduce those voids and that allowed us to push the internal linings of the building further out, which resulted in a 15% increase in the internal floor area. We were able to use the, the model that we created to coordinate with the specialist subcontractors um, and the consultants. And there was um, a series of federated uh, models were used to coordinate the and kind of run clash detection, etc. Revisiting the project, we've obviously used all of the techniques that are in our armoury now. So instead of uh, looking at uh, the shape and the form and resolving problems with physical 3D models, uh, we have a virtual model of the building uh, that was our starting point. The gantry that was uh, on the original design is set back. Uh, and it was also quite small. It over, only covered the, the, the main pitches in the middle of the ground. When there was a high ball, the cameras would hit the bottom of the media centre and they wouldn't be able to pick up a high, high ball. Jan Kaplitsky's original concept for the building had a suspended camera gantry uh, and underneath it. So there was an opportunity in redesigning the camera gantry to return to that original concept and to a certain extent complete the, the, the design as it was originally intended. The challenge for us was where to, how to support that, where to place it, so that we didn't affect the seating below, didn't affect the view from, from the media centre, and it gave all the um, views of all the wickets across the, across the ground. We concluded that hanging it from the media centre was viable, having done our uh, digital, uh, digital models that we talked about, and we could prove to ourselves that the structure had some capacity to hang it. The engineers had to work to effectively analyse the existing structure to ensure that it was able to take the new load, the new weight of a, a, a camera gantry that we needed to cantilever forwards again and that weighs about 30 tonnes. The actual performance of the gantry matched our digital model. We did, we did some on-site testing and we were able to prove that the digital model absolutely matched the dynamic performance in use. Uh, and that was pretty proud to, to see that happen. The most sensitive area from the, from the performance perspective is actually the facade, whereby at the head of the glass there is a, a movement joint which allows the media centre to just tilt forwards as people are loading it up, as people are using it. And that movement joint had been designed for a, the old use, i.e. for a, no mezzanine and no gantry supported off it. Adding those structures has tilted the building forward a little bit more and that was the most tricky thing because if the movement had been too much, the glass would shatter. So we were, that was our kind of uh, our pinch point, if you like. The first time I think I came when did a site visit and go into the Test Mash special box, you know, that you hear everything. I mean, you've been listening to Test Mash special for years. So to actually go into the room and see where they, you know, eat all their cakes and talk about everything but cricket, that was brilliant. And then obviously I would come as often as I needed to from a strictly work purpose point of view. Uh, to watch, uh, sorry, to do surveys on, you know, site. What David Miller has been able to do is to produce an extra 15% of floor space within the same shell of a building, which is uh, an amazing achievement. The broadcasters have got broadcasting studio rooms now which are uh, significantly uh, bigger. We've taken the bar area out of the dining zone uh, and put that, the, the, the bar and the kitchen uh, in the old um, dark room that the photographers used to have. Of course, we don't need a dark room anymore. Uh, that's created a much bigger space of, in the dining area. So Test Match Special are really happy because they're far more space to eat their cakes. We've managed to bring the building up to date and make it absolutely fit for purpose, uh, which preserves its uh, use into the future. And we've managed to do that while maintaining and not diluting Future Systems' original concept for the building.